Yosef uh, lives in Jerusalem, lives in Israel, uh, but has been a pioneer of sustainable solar power in the Middle East and is now spreading his technology and his wisdom down to Africa. Mr. Bramovitz. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, everybody. Um, you know, I, this is like my, I don't know, fourth or fifth session at an oil and gas conference. And so it, it's, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to kind of give a little bit of a different worldview because when the conference opened, it was very, um, you know, renewables are nice, but they really can't do much. So I, I started my, um, my whole journey in solar first in the southern part of Israel. And we had this crazy vision. Can we get to be the first region in the world to get to 100% daytime solar by 2020? And everyone said it's impossible. It's not technically feasible. It's, it's not commercially viable, et cetera. And I'm happy to report that the first region in the world to hit 100%, we're actually at 150% daytime. And by 2025, we're, we're going to be day and night. And so uh, the, 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 the question on the table, was, okay, it's nice that you did that in a developed country, um, but can you really do solar in a way that can be transformative uh, in, the, in, in the life of Africans? And that was, that was an open question uh, when we got started. Well, I guess the, the thing that we need to look at is that in a country like Burundi, if you go on the World Bank figures, only around 12% of people are on the grid. So this is a very big ask. Uh, what's it, 88% of people are not on the grid. Isn't that just too much for something like solar that doesn't produce all that much power compared to the alternatives? So in Burundi, it's not just that the World Bank says that 88% uh, are, are energy disconnected, energy poor. The IMF says it's the poorest country in the world and the utility is bankrupt. And they have hydro, which is great, but climate change is playing havoc with how predictable and how much. And so a lot of their base load has been heavy fuel oil. And so whoever is on the grid is paying the highest energy prices basically in the world. The poorest people who are getting a little bit of power are paying the highest energy prices in the world in an age of COP26 and climate change. And that climate change, again, is fueling the flooding and the lack of predictability of the, of the hydro. So that, that was a big question. So um, uh, we, have a vi we have good news for Africa today, actually. Um, you tell us. OK, so um, I'll just give you the headline, and then we have a, a short video to share with you. Um, yeah, so just uh, two, three weeks ago, when the IMF declared Burundi the poorest country on the planet, we, we launched a solar field that's providing 10%, a little more than 10% of the generation capacity. Um, and let's see what that looks like, and we we'll, can talk about the social and economic benefits so to the video. video My name is Dr. Hannah Klein. I am the Vice President of Project Management at Gigawa Global. And we have built this uh, solar plant in Burundi, in the center of Africa. We're extremely proud of this achievement, because here is the plant. Uh, and um, we built this during COVID time to add to all the other challenges. We did built this when nobody knew how the world would work. Started out with um, uh, problems with deliveries of panels from China in, in the February 2020. And we thought that would be the only issue. Uh, we had no idea that the whole world would be affected eventually. Uh, the consequence for the construction was that nobody from outside of Burundi could come to the country from March to October uh, in 2020. So everything, all the construction was done uh, by Burundians in Burundi, of course, with supervision from people who have done it before. Our Burundian team is fantastic. We just think that this is the beginning 
of uh, projects like this in Burundi, not just uh, energy projects, but, but simply uh, international investments to come to Burundi. This talent here is amazing people here. My name is Jean Bosco Musabzi. I am here from um, 2015 as, um, as a site manager for Gigawatt Global of the, the construction of the construction of the photovoltaic plant. I'm Erta Sharil Irakodze. I'm the HEC site coordinator, HEC, which, which means Health, Safety and Environment. And I'm working in the Mubuga project. During the EPC time, uh, my main job was to ensure that all the safety things were well respected and the, also to encourage women to join in our project. It is a successful project because uh, we achieved our target. Uh, at the end of the project, we saw that we had 20% 20 20 of workers, they were women, which is a good thing. Now also I'm working as an HEC site coordinator uh, for the ONM phase and I'm going to do my best to be sure that we are not going to have any accident and I will keep asking women and encouraging women to join this project. Okay, it's an opportunity for me to thank my uh, all-star team. Michael Fichtenberg led the team. Patrick, Hannah, you saw everybody else. And um, so it, it's very satisfying to come to an oil and gas conference and say, we just launched a solar field in Burundi, 10% of the generation capacity offsetting essentially heavy fuel oil. Um, and this is, this is the beginning of the revolution. This is the market signal because if we can do it in Burundi, it means every African country can have a significant portion of their grid, and we'll get to the off-grid in a minute, uh, to be powered by inexpensive and clean power. It's an energy conference, not just oil and gas. All uh, right. But, but, uh, but I hear what you say. There certainly has been a lot of talk about it. I suppose the first thing that goes to my mind, Burundi being such a small country, whose land was this? Whose land did you put this on? Right, so um, we never buy land, uh, as a matter of principle. We don't want to get involved with any land rights issues or anything like that. We, we only rent land, uh, and so it's a private landowner. Uh, the government may have different plans in terms of uh, it's now a strategic asset uh, of the country, so they, they may have to do a deal specifically with uh, the landowner, but from our perspective, it was the landowner who approached us. It came from Africa. It's not that we, we don't go parachuting in and say, you know, hey, who wants to sell this land? It's the opposite. It's the landowner saw what we did in Rwanda, which we'll see soon, and says, listen, is there an opportunity to work together? Because I would love to bring the economic development to my village. And so it came from the bottom up. Did you have any issues 
within the government of Burundi, uh, people who've invested in Africa, we will sometimes come across someone from the ruling party saying, ah, well, of course you can have the project, provided my cousin's on the board. Did you have anything like that? Did you have any pressure from the ruling party of Burundi? So the project in Rwanda, it, it took me two years. Professional government, transparent process. They're at the, near the top of the list of the ease of doing business. It took six years in Burundi. And um, uh, we're, we're bound by the UK uh, Corruption Act. We're bound by the US Foreign Corruption Practices Act. And uh, I'm a person of faith and I answer to a, a higher authority. So things take time when people offer you shortcuts and you don't take it. But I'm pleased to say that this is clean energy done cleanly. Well, I salute you for that. Anybody who, we all do business in Africa here and across Asia and Latin America. We know how difficult that can be. Uh, I saw and, and, and then I do, I do want to say thank you to the Burundian government because ultimately, you know, this, the, this was a big leap. They didn't have the regulation. There, there was changes in government. There was lots of things that it took me five years to do my first field in Israel, right? So the fact that it took six years from beginning to end in Burundi is not, I mean, it was painful as an investor, right? But um, it takes time to create a regulatory energy framework to do something that's never been done before. So I do want to actually say thank you to the, to the people who are on the other side of the, of the table because we, we actually worked through the process. And as you saw, it's the first energy investment in over 30 years. And that, that takes a lot of heavy lifting also on their side. One of the, uh, if you spend time uh, going through rural areas of South Africa, if you spend time in high density areas, here and across Africa. Uh, for me, the number one priority when I go into a beer hall of people is, can I have a job? I find myself surrounded, I find the big social problem in South Africa is people, who, especially young black people, who don't have work, and even more so after the lockdowns. Could you tell us some of the reaction, perhaps from unemployed people in a country that doesn't have a lot of jobs? There must have been some euphoria when you came in and you had a project that was going to be somewhat labor intensive. Yeah, I mean, um, what I'm always afraid of is raising expectations unrealistically, right? And that like, we, we always try to manage expectations, but we always start with the community. Just uh, as you point out, we started with the landowner, and then we went to the uh, village and to the women's cooperative. And we were, we were hearing from them also what would they like from a point of view of corporate social responsibility. And we were explaining what the process looks like. Um, but I, I'm pleased to say everything we promised we actually did, which is important. If you make promises, keep them, folks. Like, it's really, really important because all you end up with is either a good name or a bad name, right? And uh, so, so, you know, make a good name for yourself and do everything you can to, to keep the faith with the people. So um, there were obviously jobs in the construction is during COVID. Like, we... We didn't get, I think we were the only developer who built a solar field on the continent during, during the pandemic. And, and you know, it took more money and more time and more training to be able to comply with our international funding partners to be able to keep moving forward. And most of that went into things like wash stations for the communities in the area and, and the keeping, we have photos of everybody like, you know, space two meters apart. and and all of that, but there were, um, uh, you know, well over 100 jobs created uh, over an eight-month period. She said 20% were women in building the field. I want to go on record, it was 40% women, but women were not involved in the transmission lines and the, and the tower, so it brought it, brought it down to 20% um, overall. Um, there are, we have robots, I have robots cleaning my fields in Israel, because um, we're, we're in deserts and there's dust, and. We refuse to bring that kind of technology to Burundi because we want to give people the jobs. And so there's 30, 40 jobs that are uh, you know, there for 25 years and the guarding and the maintenance and the, and the cleaning uh, of it. And uh, of course, we've set up, because of the Women's Cooperative, uh, we're doing this right now, um, a, an energy entrepreneurial hub for productive uses of the power um, and the other we're doing other nice things that I think anybody going into the poorest place on the planet would do, that you, that you Jeff, would do. Well, let me, let me ask you something that worries me greatly in countries like Mozambique and Uganda. We're sitting here with electricity. 
some of which quite possibly comes from Kaburabasa. Mozambique is one of the top 20 power exporters in the world, and yet 75% of Mozambicans are not on the grid. Uganda has East Africa's biggest solar farm just north of, north of Kampala. Uganda exports much of that electricity to Kenya. So fine, you're generating electricity. Are people's homes being lit up? How do you stop in the future the government of Burundi or even Rwanda simply selling that power next door to a hungry country like Kenya, when it's a hungry power, uh, a power short country like Kenya? Great question. So let me tell you a little bit about Rwanda and we'll show you the video shortly. So when President Obama, it was Obama Biden at the time, announced the U.S. Power Africa Initiative, it was to a great fanfare. They wanted to get to 30 or 60 million interconnections, right, um, uh, on the continent in a certain number of years, and all sorts of monies were promised. And, and they made this announcement in Tanzania, and then nothing happened because infrastructure and energy takes a long time. You can't just sort of you know, say something and it's created, you know, like, like the six days of creation. It doesn't work that way. Um, and so we took it upon ourselves uh, to do the, the field in Rwanda, and it was the first interconnection for, uh, uh, for Obama Biden. We're, we're, we're pleased to be able to tell you guys that the first interconnection for Biden Harris is, is Burundi uh, as well. But when we began in, um, in Rwanda, um, there was only 20% electrification in the region we're working in. And which is totally normal for Africa, as you've pointed out. And what we said to the utility, we said, look, we're doing 100% financing. We'll take care of the generation here. You work on the interconnections. And here we are, you know, six years later. You want to guess what the electrification rate is? Well, I know that last mile technology, as they call it, is a huge challenge, getting it from the substation to people's homes. Give me a number, Tell Jeff. Come on. Oh, I don't know. 5%. We're at 80% electrification in that region. Hey. Applause, please. Thank you. 80%. <laughs> That's so very good. That's a huge because challenge. Because the utility didn't have to worry about the generation. We, we took care of that. We did that. And, we, and, and look, they're also enlightened, as you pointed out, um, so uh, we'll, we'll see what happens now in Burundi. In addition to doing some of the mini-grid things that we're, we're doing, we'll see if we can replicate that. But wherever we go, we want to be able to make sure that we're stabilizing the grid, we're enhancing economic opportunity. And, uh, but but my, my projects in Kenya that hopefully soon will go up, it's last mile generation. There's a grid. People are interconnected, but there's no power in them. They're empty in those locations. So we're going to be doing the power right there, and the interconnections are there. They're just, they're just blank. Kenya has been very successful in this in the last 10 years uh, in getting far more people onto the grid than we've seen in most parts of Africa. And it is a political issue. It's enormous. The price of electricity is a political issue here in South Africa, yes? It's, a, it's a enormous. <laughs> Anybody who pays an ESCOM bill. Not only that, but our power here has VAT on it. All our solar components have VAT on it. This is something I want to ask you, and I did raise it, excuse me, those who were at my, one of my sessions I moderated yesterday, excuse me being repetitive, but it's an important point. If you go through a high-density area in South Africa, uh, around about the second, third, fourth of the month, all the shacks have lights on. When you go through after the 20th of the month, a lot of shacks have lights off. Why? Because people have to feed the meter with a coupon from SPA, and their salary has run out. So the fact that people have a wire coming into their house doesn't mean they have power on at home. In such a poor country, are people in, Rwanda, in Burundi particularly going to be able to afford to buy the power? So, um, so first of all, we're, we're displacing expensive heavy fuel oil. That's an important point, and I know there's some fuel companies here, but this is, this is good for humanity and good for the planet, and, and you, you too can make an energy transition in, in, in your business models to incorporate more and more uh, renewables. The, because of the unique vulnerable status of Burundi, we're trying to work with the international community to also help um, do tariff offset. I, I guess I'll say this publicly on the record. I mean, we're very disappointed that the World Bank, through uh, IDA, one of their facilities, and the African Development Bank has still not granted Burundi any grants to, to make things even more affordable. And we took all the risk. Like, we 
took all the risk in the poorest country on the planet. And what are these development finance institutions for if they're not to, to help the poorest people be but able to so do far, this? Sorry, is that sustainable? You're going to pay people's power bills for next year and the year after and the year after. How do you get to a point where consumers are able to pay their own power bills, particularly, as you were saying earlier on, I think, that there's a state power monopoly. Is that right, in Burundi? Yes. Yeah, so um, there, there's a utility, right? And it's, it is government-owned. So again, we've lowered the prices for those who are on, and then we're trying to, we are doing the productive uses to try to bring economic activity in those specific areas. Now, I'm not the, I'm, I'm not the government of Burundi, and I'm not the World Bank, right? Can't solve everyone's problems, certainly not all at once. But can we show it's possible? Did I just make you know a difference in the lives of these people in those villages? By the way, the people that we employed, it was the first time that I think any of them, or certainly the supermajority, ever had a job that actually had a pay, like they're, they're subsistence farmers. They, they were not in whatever employment registry. We, we were the first ones to be able to do that. Um, I'm sorry to say, like I, 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 I wish. That wasn't the case, but the things that we could do, we did. Uh, we've, we've certainly not been greedy at all. Like uh, it's been, it's been a very painful process, I have to say, as an impact investor um, on this. And I do think the international needs to come through uh, with greater aid. But we've now shown them that there's a pathway, and that that is important. No one believed there was a pathway until Rwanda. So with that, let's let's quickly show yeah. the Rwanda video, please. The, the main reason I want to show you the Rwanda video, because it was, okay, you go ahead and show it, because um, we figured it's the first African field, so we did it in the shape of Africa. Play it. This is a 40 megawatt in Israel. I think. Power Africa, a strong and prosperous and self-reliant Africa. Yeah. We call on the United Nations to affirm that access to green power and affordable green power should be elevated as a fundamental human right for all of humanity and for all people. I want to say thank you to Goza Shalom uh, Youth Village uh, for being our partners. And with Power Africa, we commit to a thousand megawatts by 2020. And what we can see from up here today for Rwanda and Africa and the world is hope. So we have a pipeline of 500 out of thousand. Have a water pipeline. A, a pipeline of projects throughout the oh, continent. Oh, I see. Uh, okay. 500. Uh, I thought you were back onto oil and gas with uh, the pipeline. No, 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 not that kind of pipeline. <laughs> Can you let me play devil's advocate here for a moment? Um, I was in Tanzania not long ago. Tanzania has four billion tons of coal in its southern border. They're exploiting it, and they're going to build a a, a coal-fired power station. Egypt has built one super high, what are they called? Ultra supercritical on the Red Sea. Uh, the UAE has done the same thing, making it as clean as they possibly can, uh, producing baseload power. Would it not have been more practical to actually import Tanzanian coal or import gas and create baseload power? Isn't there? Can you understand some of your critics, of which I'm not one, may I add, but can you understand some of your critics saying, ah, oh, you're playing white savior coming in and saying, you can have energy, provided you have my kind of energy, because that's nice for the planet. In a country where 
88% of people have no power at all and who would embrace, presumably, power from any source at all. Can you understand critics who, who say that and who say, well, why do you need to put solar in a country that's so desperate for any kind of power? So I was in the room, thank you for the question. I was in the room yesterday when uh, His Excellency, the Energy Minister of the Republic of South Africa, spoke. And he's absolutely right, <coughs> excuse me, he's absolutely right about the hypocrisy of the developed world. He's absolutely right. Like, the West burnt their way, our way, to prosperity, and then said, oh, and you guys, you don't, don't burn your way to prosperity. However, just because there's hypocrisy in the West doesn't mean you should pursue the wrong policies for your people. It, it, it shouldn't be, a, 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 in my view, a counter-reaction to then <coughs> do the most polluting, more expensive, uh, certainly on a macroeconomic, you know, for another generation, especially when you're suffering under the effects of climate change disproportionately. And so the West is hypocritical, fine. But you know what? According to the International Energy Agency, solar power is the cheapest power on the planet today. It's cheaper than coal even, you know? And who's gonna pay for the asthma of all the kids, you know, from, from the, the coal plant? So it's not white savior. We're, we're not in Tanzania because, you know, we lost money there and uh, we, we walked because there are international standards, right? But if someone from Tanzania would come and allow a government guarantee, the government undermined the solar industry maybe on purpose, don't know, so they can move forward with more expensive and polluting coal. But they would have had a very vibrant solar industry at this point. We had a 300 megawatt, uh, you know, relatively ready to go, but they refused to give a government guarantee, even though that's one of the conditions of all the MOUs and everything. Well, we're not here talking about Tanzania, but if I can just fill in very briefly, uh, just something was told to me that was interesting. People talk about the war of Al-Shabaab in northern Mozambique. Always remember that it's a war in northern Mozambique and southern Tanzania. It's a cross-border war. And that's where the coal belt is in southern Tanzania. Um, enormous levels of unemployment. And a minister said to me there, if you go down to where the coal fields are, where there's virtually no jobs, where people are being drawn into terror groups and militia because there's just no jobs, and you tell the people of southern Tanzania, you cannot mine your coal. She said, they will chase you out of the village. They will chase you out of town. And so I d when you ask why doesn't Tanzania go that road, I don't have an answer. I can just tell you what I was told by the minister there. Yeah, so I, I just want to point out, like we, when we decided to work in Nigeria, we picked the north. We picked the north. There has to be other employment and other options. They have better sun, by the way, up north, right? But we picked the north. We're the only people who went north for the, those exact kind of reasons. There is an alternative both in energy and in economic development. And again, we're trying to represent success stories and hope so you don't have to go the route of extremism or fossil fuels. I was just saying to somebody here on, uh, before lunch, um, if an audience falls asleep, it's not because the audience is doing something wrong, it's because we're not doing something right. And so I hope you're enjoying this. We're going to throw open to questions just now, and I hope that we have some good questions coming. I know we will have some good oh, questions I just want to introduce from past panels. Uh, we're represented locally. Ra Rachel, say hello. Oh, uh, Rachel. Uh, Rachel. So, um, hey, hey. Um, Excellent. One of the things that strikes me in these videos, and for anybody who's been to Rwanda and Burundi, is the massive level of deforestation. Trees have been cut down. That's not climate change. That's people who have cut down forests and haven't replanted the trees. And um, one of the key reasons for the loss of forests in Africa is firewood. Yep. People, and that's not because people are bad and cutting down trees. Uh, because 600 million people on this continent have no electricity and no other way of cooking, no other way of keeping warm. So is there any chance, once you provide electricity, that you can even acre by acre, hectare by hectare, start to storing some of the forest in Burundi and in Rwanda? Yeah, so uh, the answer is of course. We, we, we have some great startups uh, that are associated with us, a home biogas system for agricultural waste, so you can cook off of that um, and, and other things. So yeah, again, we're, we're not the government, we're not the World Bank. We do the things that 
we can do, right? Um, and uh, so part of the, we'll, we'll see what they want to do. Like part of it is just listening to, to your partners uh, on the ground. But you're absolutely right. Uh, I think Burundi has one of the highest uh, deforestation rates in the world precisely because they're poor and they need to cook. And uh, maybe, maybe uh, you know, some new, new power, uh, both at the village level as well as on the national level can, uh, and, and it affects, by the way, the women and girls most. So we're, we're as much as we can do, we're, we're doing, but there are, there are models. Let's see if there's... Yes, here. can anybody here in the hall, oh, let me get up so I can think. Um, anybody here got a question? I, actually, the lights were in my eyes there, so I couldn't see a hand coming. What I need you to do is to say your name um, and then ask a question. Um, come on, be brave. Can I see any hands? No? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Oh, we've got two at the same table. Excellent. Can you say your name and ask a question, please? Yeah, yes, 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 right here. Oh, you need the mic, don't you? Uh, sorry. Wake up, Jeffrey. <laughs> um, good afternoon. My name is Louise. I'm from Namibia. Um, there was a presentation earlier in this same venue where a presenter said um, something on energy return on investment. And I think what he said was that um, when it comes to energy return on investment, solar and wind will be a much or will be more expensive as compared to fossil fuels. Or <laughs> I heard you said that uh, solar is cheaper. So it's why, I'm, it's why I'm asking this. And he said something, he spoke also about energy intensity, where he said um, energy intensity of solar is much worse or much less than um, fossil fuels. And again, also he spoke about um, the energy required to produce the materials that are to be used for the solar panels, for instance. That obviously it will also be now a bit more costly or, to, or it will add to the cost of producing uh, the materials for the solar panels. And he spoke about the fact that all renewables um, materials, are, or all renewable energy sources needs a backup. Like in the case of uh, the solar panels, they do need like batteries as a backup or some, something else as a backup. And this makes it more expensive than uh, the conventional energy sources that we have. So why do you now say solar is more cheaper than the other conventional sources? Maybe if you can just deliberate a bit right. on that. A Thank good you. series of questions. Remind me of the name again, because I was paying attention Very to the good question. question. Lu Louise? Okay. Louise, Louise, Louise. The qu and, and the comment she's referring to were Dr. Lars yeah. on the Eric Prince uh, panel, and he was saying, you made some good notes, goodness me, that's exactly what he was saying, yes. Okay, Louise, wonderful questions, and let me set the record straight. Thank you very much. So it used to be what's called the carbon footprint, um, the amount of um, greenhouse gas emissions that is emitted in the energy intense process of making a solar panel, right? It used to, the panel would p repay its carbon footprint in about seven years, right? Uh, and, and a panel that would last 25 years. Because of the economies of scale, the panel now repays its carbon footprint in two years, right? So just a, there's no such thing as pure energy that can be harvested, you know, without any carbon footprint, right? So, we, we, you know, we know the carbon footprints, obviously, of uh, oil and gas and coal. But when you make a wind turbine, it takes, you know, someone had to mine the steel, someone had to smelt it, someone had to transport it. And so it has a, everything has impact, right? And what we're trying to do is to, is to make the impact smaller, the carbon footprint smaller. So solar panels now is down to two years. In terms of energy intensity, uh, th that's like apples and oranges and things about, you know, yeah, if you heat up a furnace to a thousand degrees, it has this much intensity, et cetera, but a solar panel is 20% efficient. Th th that's just gobbledygook, scientific gobbledygook. What is the price, right, for the consumer per kilowatt hour? That's what I want to know, right? Because we're trying to drive economic development, and some of us are trying to drive it by replacing the, the heavy fuel oil, which maybe it has, it can burn brighter, you know, as a percentage, et cetera. But we are cheaper per kilowatt hour for the utility and for the consumer than oil, gas, and coal today. It's really important. International Energy <laughs> Agency's 2021 report 
you know, they, they're, they're not partial one way or the other. They're not in this pocket or that pocket. That's just straight scientific. So thank you for letting me put the record straight on that. I wish you'd been on the earlier panel. I think you'd have been throwing apples and oranges at each other. Uh, we had another question over here. By the way, for those who uh, haven't seen me before, my name's Jeff, Jeff Hill. Uh, a journalist, and I run a small intelligence company as well. We're going to get to everybody's question. That was a great one, Louise. Sir, you were next. Please give us your name and your question. Thanks, Jeff. I'm Joseph Mahendran, and I'm from Johannesburg. The uh, question that I had is more of a point than a question. Have you guys looked at, you know, when you're talking about deforestation and Burundi and stuff like that, NISP certification at all, which is Nature Inclusive so Solar Park? Have you guys looked at that at all? So, uh, as I said in one of my earlier talks, I'm also here to learn. And so, no, I'm going to look that up. I do know that, like in Kenya, we're near the National Park of the Maasai, and we've been working with them to make sure that, you know, we're not like cutting down trees and, you know, it's the opposite. We're, we're only going to enhance nature wherever. And also, we do it. Uh, not only a social inc uh, uh, impact study, we do we do an environmental impact study just to make sure that the footprint is as light as possible. In in Rwanda, they started growing pineapples now, <laughs> like all over, which is you know some, I should get a photo of that. But so nature based to say it one more time. Thank you very much. What we are doing now in Israel, we're getting we're we're figuring out what's called agrovoltaics. Because um, you don't want to take land, particularly in a small country, and instead of growing food for your people, to do to do the energy. And so, how do you do both? Now we're we're getting that really down, um, and we're we're actually able to increase the yield of certain crops by not having the direct sunlight uh, on them. So, agrovoltaics may be another version of what you're talking about, and we're going we're going big on that. Thank you, Joseph. Excellent. Next question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Sergio. I'm from Mozambique. And the reason why I'm going to ask questions because I had a gentleman talking so many times about Mozambique. So I just felt I had to say something. Um, well, y I heard you saying, uh, uh, mentioning about Kahora Bas, uh, that, that maybe, that yeah, exactly, uh, that probably a vast majority of people in Mozambique are, are, are don't, don't have access to that power, which is true. But I think you also need to keep in mind that uh, in any power generation uh, project, you have to have a, a reliable of take up before you can even uh, try and make that power available to people. So we're sitting with a, a problem, which is a, a realistic one, as we're trying to increase our power generating capacity. We have to have a reliable of take before we can even make that power available to our own people. So that's the challenge we're having. and. We, we, if you could help us with some idea and how do we find an equilibrium in terms of, uh, uh, on one side, uh, making the project uh, bankable, and on the other side, providing, uh, increasing the uh, universal access to electricity, who will welcome that? The second question is, right, is he, he, the, one, the first one was a comment, rather. Uh, the, sec the second one was on, on coal. We, we talk a lot about coal being a polluting I mean, uh, source of energy. Perhaps because we are assuming steam coal, which is the one that is mostly used for power generation. But remember, in the case of Mozambique again, we do have coking coal, which is the one that is used for uh, steel, uh, iron and steel industry. And I really don't think they say uh, a, a, a strong substitute to, to that kind of uh, to that kind of uh, carburant for uh, uh, iron and steel industry. Wouldn't it be better to invest more in, in research and development to come up with technologies that are less polluting rather than saying, okay, let's get away with coal. And remember, coal, the coal reserves are limited in time. I mean, even if you, if you mine coal, uh, you reach a certain point where those reserves will be all gone. So wouldn't it be better to invest more in research and development rather yeah. Right. Uh, th thank you. Thank you for both those questions, which remind me. Sergio, me. Sergio, and just if I may add, there, yeah. Mozambique has one of the world's largest coal mines at Moetizia. So uh, right. yeah, it's very current. Uh, so, Joseph. Yes. Yeah, so Sergio, while you're speaking, I realized I didn't answer the last one of the questions of Louise, which is that the area that we're doing 100% daytime solar, there's no batteries and it's baseload. Uh, there's just a lot of places in Africa that are very similar to our deserts, and you, you can do that. Mozambique. So. Um, 
you have an energy deficit of four to six gigawatts um, to be able to bring power to, to the people. And in Mozambique, we've decided, like in Nigeria, to work in the north. So we're in Nyasa uh, province, and uh, we're working with the Anglican Church there. Um, and uh, uh, there, there is a grid, and EDM has been great, uh, really just phenomenal. We're right next to the substation. Um, and we're looking forward to begin with a 15 megawatts, modest, but it's a way to get started to be able to, because also you know that they're not going to build the gas pipelines from the shore, you know, all the way up, you know, in, 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 into the country. You're absolutely right about the off-taker and a bankable off-taker. And there's, there's government related like the utility and then there's private off-takers. So I, I, I apologize, I don't know that region where the coal is, if there's any, other things that are there, or maybe the government can incentivize an industrial zone. You see a lot of countries in Africa now establishing industrial zones, which then will need power. So there's a way to incentivize businesses to go to certain areas. I, again, I, I apologize, I don't know that particular region of Mozambique well. So if you do an industrial zone and then you have that as the off-taker of renewables, then you don't have to go on the coal. In terms of research and development, um, the, 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 you know, Israel, where I come from, has a lot of innovation, but not around coal. So I, I'm, I'm also happy to learn about it, but I just don't want to use research and development as an excuse not to go to renewables. Like, you know, it's fine. We should, whatever power plants now, figure out how to scrub it, et cetera. I think what's most challenging for Mozambique in terms of what you're burning is that there's this whole euphoria about the natural gas, right? just at a time where we're trying to cut methane uh, emissions worldwide significantly um, because of the potency of methane over CO2, like the burning the coal is CO2 and bad and all of that stuff, uh, the air is dirtier. But methane is so much more uh, dangerous, uh, particularly in the short term as you think about humanity, uh, you know, 20 to, 20 to 30 years. And so the, I think the window will be closing very shortly on what the international community is going to tolerate from a funding perspective, because if 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 Mozambique is taking seriously its pledge of zero net you know emissions by 2050, that's 28 years, and so if it takes three to seven years to create a gas-fired plant or a coal-fired one for the, for that matter, that window is closing, and and so I think we're going to have to all get very creative, and since we are cheaper. Um, why not use the South to, to power the rest of the country? Just in some context there of Sergio's comment, and again, uh, me making declarations, the wife from Burundi, I'm actually from Mutari, on the border of Zimbabwe and Mozambique, but I think that was, Vale opened the mind, didn't they, in Moetize, one of the biggest investments in Mozambique history, so it wasn't small change, but very good comments. Um, who, who's, yes, sir, let me come, and then I'm going to come to you. Hi there. Hi. Uh, my name is Ate, Ate Taku, I'm from Cameroon. Um, I've been listening a lot on this uh, discussions of uh, alternatives to renewables. We keep talking about solar, about uh, wind, gas. I haven't heard much about biofuels. Mm. Is there a particular reason for that omission? I mean, considering we're in Africa where 80% of Africa's population lives on agriculture, there's a whole chunk of arable and usable land. The infrastructure is there for liquid fuels. Wouldn't it be something we should look at seriously for Africa, I don't say for other parts of the world, where we can quickly, in short periods, get some biofuels we can use on the technologies we have today, on the vehicles we have, on the pump stations we have, mm. and we can get people to jobs, rural people, uh, using what we have. I mean, why is there not much talk about biofuels? Yeah, so Ate, you're so making a, gr a great... Bioethanol, bioethanol, yeah. biodiesel. I mean, it shouldn't take much to get yeah. uh, vegetable oil to use on a diesel truck today. Right. Um, take a petrol truck, uh, mix it with bioethanol. Yeah. Why is that not being discussed at large? So I actually, Ate, thank you so much. It's a great correction. I, I think there's, there's two things, actually, which uh, I, I don't know why they're, ha they're not happening really in Africa. Maybe because they're not carbon neutral, but what really is the question of... So one is, I mean... You can take agricultural waste. I mean, it is still an agriculturally based continent overall and turn it into biofuels. I completely agree with you. It's not my field, but uh, 
it, I, I think, thank you for putting it on the table. And the other one is the waste to energy. You just, you know, it's heartbreaking to, to come, you know, to countries. I mean, parts of my countries are also feels like a, you know, a trash bin and I'm upset and we're trying to ban plastic bags now. By the way, Rwanda, when you, when you land in Rwanda, the security, they go through your bag. They're not looking for drugs or anything. They're looking for plastic bags. Boy, Kagami has her, it's a clean country. And once a month, at the same time, everyone goes out and they, and they clean up their neighborhoods. It's a, it's a really clean, what a, what a great model for, for all of us. Um, but waste to energy, I think, you know, even though there are emissions, uh, I think it, it too has its place. So maybe with a little bit of R&D that Sergio is recommending, how to make the biofuels maybe more economical or more efficient, and certainly the same thing with waste energy. Thank you for, for that. Attempt. Very good. Thank you. Sir, you had a question. Your name and the question, please. Yeah, thanks. My name is Jori, and I'm a lawyer with DLA Piper in, in the Netherlands. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for pointing out that the hypocrisy of the West in, in trying to enforce clean energy is not in itself a reason to entirely disregard clean energy. It, it's something I had been struggling with uh, hearing uh, the presentations at this conference. So I think you, you put that very eloquently and that was very, very insightful uh, for me. Um, the, the question, perhaps a little bit off topic, but, but now you're here and you're an expert on, on solar. Uh, I wanted to, to pick your brain. Um, it's about the, the value chain, the supply chain, and, and the production process, because we hear a lot of concerns that this is actually very much controlled by, by China and Chinese parties, and there's also human rights concerns in the, in the supply chain. Do, do you see this as an impediment to the development of solar, and, and do you actually see a role for, for Africa, for the continent, in the production of, of solar? Uh, I would love, love to have Excellent locally question. produced solar panels, but the problem is the ministers that were on the stage the other day, they're not giving you guys any horizon that there's gonna be enough demand. If, if the continent would do 10 to 20 gigawatts a year, which it can do and it should do, et cetera, then I believe the manufacturing will move here and it's worth doing it. But when there's so much uncertainty, um, what I proposed yesterday also is a, a feed-in tariff of 10 cents per kilowatt hour across all 54 countries. No more negotiation no more bids, no more uncertainty to, to just drive you know, investors to, to, to come in with the same guarantees, the same technical assistance, just off, off the shelf, everything is known in advance essentially to be able to, to get those uh, investments to, to come in. So until there's horizon, uh, there, there is a small plant I believe in South Africa, until there's horizon for a real market in Africa, then I don't think there'll be manufacturing Unfortunately, um, thank you for your... Yosef, you got people stirred up here. I, I've seen this room full and we haven't had as many questions from a full room and we haven't had such deep questions. Uh, the audience here is doing a wonderful job. Is there anybody else who would like to ask anything? Uh, not this week's lotto numbers. Uh, here we are, sir. So um, I'm Pedro Villanculo, a business developer from Mozambique, actually. Okay, great. Um, it's a little bit in line of what Sergio say, and there was a panel at the NetBank building in the morning, Mr. Adzina and, um, and uh, Bernico. So um, the issue is, I believe we are all concerned about um, getting clean energy and um, reducing CO2 footprint. And 2050, one of these um, great things that uh, it's, it's good for us today, but it's good also for future generation. But also, um, the speech about how do we do that? How do we increase efficiency and sustainability? It's, um, it seems to me, I might be wrong, correct me, to, 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 to be a speech that is so sweet, but at some time doesn't serve the interest of countries like uh, Mozambique and other countries from from, from Africa because the challenge for Africa is to grow their economies. We need to grow our economies, uh, build strong economies, is to industrialize. And to do that, those to grow an economy and industrialize, there, there, there's a need, intensive need of use of energy. So how do we build the balance between the interests of development for Africa and the global global common interest to, 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 to make sure that we, we increase um, sustainability. How do we do that? Can yeah. we learn from Rwanda? What, what do you have to say for us, Joseph? Thank you. Yeah, no, th thank you for the question. And 
Right. Oh, yes, I know it very well. <laughs> Not as well as you, but I know it well. Look, Yosef. The, yeah, the, obviously, we can't make choices for each country. We can just put options on the table. And we can put options that I, I hope are more attractive than your current options, right? And it's for you to choose. Now, how you come to decisions, you know, m maybe it's in transparent ways, maybe it's not. Maybe it's in democratic ways, maybe it's in the special interest, or maybe it's in the public interest. That we, we have no impact on. But now we've just expanded your menu of opportunities, of options, of financing. We're coming with 100% financing. I mean, that's, that's pretty good, right? We're coming with a lower price and without a negative you know, environmental footprint. We're coming with jobs and economic development. So all we can do is say, we've done it already. Like, it's one thing for me to come, great, from the West, from a developed country and saying, I'm promising this, we could do this, there's potential, you know. Um, but what we did instead is we did it. Uh, and 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 I'm I'm just hoping that we're messengers of hope. You call that a sweet a sweet message. We'll take we'll take the sweetness as well, right? But wh whether or not you want more uh, is is only up to you. If I were the minister of energy, and you can fill in the blank, you know, if there was one minister of energy for all of Africa, I know what my policy would be. First, I'd declare a climate crisis because there is one, and it's disproportionately affecting poor people, particularly in Africa. The second is I would have a 100% solar energy goal by 2030 and give certainty to investors because there isn't you know, on that. And then we're talking about R&D. I think some of you, many of your countries are more advanced on getting to net zero than you know. Because you know, if Ethiopia, which is at war, but Ethiopia, they're 85% already on the road to net zero because of hydro, right? They only have to account, they only have to swap over 15%. Well, that, that's pretty good, right? As, uh, but they're not the only example. You, I looked at a, a thing in Ghana, where the, the, the Bui power plant, and so they have reservoir capacity. And we said, look, do solar during the day and hold back the water, right? Use it like a battery. You have a, you have a low tech, but a very effective battery. So I think many of the, African countries are ahead of the Western countries on the road to net zero. I think what's worrying the international community is, is that, you know, because we all want economic development, because that's how you lift human dignity, right? To meet people's needs. We're, we're afraid that the choices will be made are carbon choices that um, maybe you're looking short term. And so thank you for the opportunity to expand the opportunities before you, uh, which are cheaper and healthier and come with full financing, and whether you want to take them, I, I wish you luck. Yosef, thank you so much. Uh, one of the things that always marks a South African audience, uh, in my experience, is this courteous exchange of different views. Uh, there are people who have very strong views here. Yosef has strong views. There's been no bad language. There's been no shouting. There's been no throwing of apples and oranges. Give yourselves a big hand, please. You have been a wonderful, wonderful audience. We haven't all agreed here. The one thing we've agreed on is that you can have a discussion without fighting with each other. Yosef Abramovitz, thank you so much thank for you, giving Jeff. us thank time. Thank you, big Thank hand you for, the for giving us your time <laughs> and a lot to think about. And thank you to the audience. Give our speaker a big hand, please. Yeah, give our moderator a big hand. Thank you very hand. much. <laughs>